Hello everyone and welcome back to Football a la Turca episode 8 today where I'm here joined by Umut Nadere and Pat Cox because of course are my traditional co-hosts. Um, couldn't be here today, Burak is still in the States, still on his wrestling tour and Uzer, uh, I'm not 100% sure on what Uzer is doing today. Let's just say that he's uh, sipping a nice espresso on... Uh, a terrace somewhere but pat thank you for coming and joining us again bailing us out again and the same thing for you umut this is your first full-fledged appearance of course but pat this is your second one already uh, and Hello. thanks to both of you for for coming on and talking some turkish football with me thanks for having us hello so uh we're back from the international break uh how did you guys experience uh, the international break to be honest with the international's not really having so much importance in terms of matches. You know, things have just started. Mm-hmm. To be honest, it was just me looking forward to uh, the Super League and other football starting again. Proper football. What about you, Umut? Were you a little bit... Um... Yeah, actually bored because yeah. lack of the games. <laughs> I know, uh, right? We have the summer coming up in, in just a couple of months, so uh, it's going to be fun. Um, but let's dig into uh, Turkish football proper. Let's dig into the Turkish Cup. It was also played. Uh, the semi-finals in the Turkish Cup were played this past week as well. Um, Galatasaray took on Malatya Spor at the Turk Telecom Arena. And I know, Umut, you were present there. Uh, that ended in a nil-nil draw. And then Umranye Spor took on Akisar. And that ended in a 1-0 win for Akisar, with Jeremy Bokila getting the only goal in the 86th minute. Um, not too much to be said there. Akisar looking good for their second successive cup final in Turkey, um, which is kind of um, funny given the fact that they are in a little bit of a precarious position in the league and, and are almost certain to go down. Uh, so they could be in Europe next season, despite uh, p- possibly... Most likely relegating. Galatasaray against Malatya Spor, 0-0 draw. Not a, not a good scoreline for either side. It could be very treacherous. I mean, Galatasaray only need to score one goal and then uh, then Malatya would have to score two. But the most important part in this match is probably uh, Luin Dama's red card uh, that resulted in a two-game suspension. Um, Umut, what were your thoughts from the stands? Did you think it was a red card? And afterwards having seen the footage did your opinion change in any way yeah yeah definitely uh, in the stand you can like uh, see very close because uh, it could be uh, in a, a bad shape uh, or like uh, you can't be decisive uh, from the stands you're far from it, but uh, after seeing the footage, uh, my opinion definitely changed because the studs were into the opponent's arm. Uh, so definitely a red card from me. And do you feel that the uh, that the two game suspension is sufficient, or do you think this was uh, worthy of a longer suspension? No, no, because uh, the two game is all right. Uh, just a direct red card should be two games, not more. Mm-hmm. Okay. What about you, Pat? What did you think? Did you see the red card, and and what do you think? I did. Yeah, I think. Um, no, I, I agree. I think if it's a direct red card, and it was, it was quite, I guess, unlucky in some senses because I don't think it was malicious. But when you do have a, a high boot, you are risking anything really, and uh, that's exactly what happened this time. Hmm. Yeah, I, th- I thought it was a little uh, excessive, really. Definitely excessive force. It, it looked more like a karate kick than it looked like a high boot to me. So I think he got a little lucky with two games, to be fair. I think it's because of uh, Lindama's playing style. He mm. likes to play Yeah, he takes lots, lots of risks, for sure. Yeah. Now, I, I don't really think, like, like Pat said, I don't really think he had any malicious intent. But uh, maybe it just looked a little bit worse than it than it really was. Um, he was just careless, I think. But what do you think of Galtry's chances, Malatya Sports' chances? Who is your favorite to go through? Umut, you first, please. Uh, like uh, Errol Blut is a good coach uh, in the league, mm-hmm. but uh, against top teams, he uh, wants to play a compact defense, but and uh, searching for counter attacks. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he was uh, like risking 
uh, the game with that uh, manner. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, you you're not going to find uh, any opportunity in that way of playing. Uh, Galatasaray has the pressure, uh, and uh, they all need uh, a goal uh, against Malatya Sport and uh, also. Galsa have the advantage if they score uh, the away goal yep. uh, will take them to the final. Yeah, and and I I would like to add to what you're saying there in regards to Errol Bulut's uh, ta- tactics. Um, I was v- very underwhelmed with Malatya Spor after the red card. They I don't I think they created one chance that was a good chance, uh, and that one came uh, when when Bifuma was put in, but he put in Bifuma in like the 86th minute or something. And yeah, yeah, too late. Pl- yeah, you're playing against 10 men for 20 plus minutes or whenever Luyen Dama's red card was, I it kind of, oh, the 72nd minute I've got in my notes here. But so you're playing 20 plus minutes against 10 men and you're keeping one of those really tricky fast players like Bifuma on the bench uh, until the very l- last few minutes. It's It was kind of puzzling to me and, and he immediately m- made his presence felt and almost put Malatya Spor ahead and, and had he scored, of course, then it would have been very different going into the second leg, but now the nil-nil, I think that's treacherous for mainly Malatya Spor maybe because they don't really have an advantage. I mean, they have to score regardless Otherwise, it's going to extra time and penalties. So, this is probably more in Galtzrai's favor than it is in Malatya, uh, come to think of it. Would you agree, Pat? Yeah, I think um, it's advantage Galatasaray. Yeah. And just in terms of... I think just in terms of the season, you know, Galatasaray aren't going to squander um, their chances like the Fenerbahce's and um, Pashak Shahir's have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then, uh, of course, Umrani Akisar. I mean, with that win for Akisar, it's difficult to imagine Umrani turning that around. They need two goals on the road. Akisar, uh, probably in their second uh, consecutive uh, Turkish Cup final, and and that's something to be commended for sure. Yeah, 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 definitely. Okay, uh, that's enough said about the Turkish Cup. Let's move on to the meat and potatoes. Let's move on to the match day 27 Turkish Super League results. Take care. On Friday, we had one match, and that was Trabzonspor against Antalya Spor. This match ended in 4 2 1 in favor of the hosts. Suleymana Dukara had started the scoring in the ninth minute and put the visitors ahead, but Antoni Nwakaemis' equalizer in the 21st minute put a halt to that. Kaleb Ekuban scored in the 58th minute to make it 2-1, and Oljay Shahan made it 3-1 just 10 minutes later in the 67th minute. Murat Jem Akpinar scored the fourth goal in added time to make it 4-1 to Antalya Spor, but perha- uh, 4-1 to Trabzonspor, pardon me, but perhaps not uh, the most telling scoreline because it was a fairly competitive match, especially in the first half. Um, I remember Anilton having a really big chance to make it 2-0 before Nakaeme managed to equalize, um, but he hit the post and uh, Trabzonspor kind of escaped there. Then Dukara had a couple of big one-on-one opportunities as well, both at 1-1... Uh, both at 1-1, I think. Um, good goal and assist for Oljay Shahan, who gets the assist on the second goal, I want to say. or the, No, sorry, the first goal. And he, of course, scored the third goal. And Anthony Wakayeme returned the favor by assisting Oljay's goal with a very elusive dribble to keep a lot of um, Antalya Sports players busy in the box. And uh, Ikuban scoring on a rebound from Abdul Kadir's shot that hit the crossbar. So, Pat, I'm going to throw to you first. What were your thoughts of this match? Do you think the yeah. scoreline properly reflects uh, the, the, the match? Or do you think that Antalya Spor perhaps uh, lost a little bit heavily? No, I think it's like um, the other time I was on here. I think it was it Galatasaray scored five. Was that against Antalya Spor as well? That might actually have been Antalya Spor, yeah. Yeah, and but that was a game where it could have been three one to Antalya Spor at half time. Oh, but then, right. yes, you're right. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. then they capitulated in the mm-hmm. second half. And this, to me, this is exactly the same. Like you say, 
when they were one nil up, they had a great chance to get the second, which, you know, when you're two nil down at a half time or similar, it makes it difficult to get back into it. But, uh, you know, luck went against them this time. And, um, yeah. And while then, they did have their chances. Yeah. And as you pointed out, not the first time, I remember against Besiktas too, they lost that match 6-2 to at home, but that was another game in which the scoreline definitely did not reflect, reflect the, the match we saw because they definitely could have gotten something from that match, you'd think. And the same thing happened in the Galtzray game, so you're very right yeah. in pointing that out. So maybe a little bit of a recurring team for them. Um, but what's your yeah. thoughts about it, Umut? Well, uh, I have to tell that uh, it's like uh, always when Bland Korkmaz plays against a bigger team than he uh, he manages. Uh, it's about the courage uh, of the team. Uh, when he finds a goal, he tries to defend it. Uh, then uh, uh, it's tend to lose the game. He is tend to lose the game uh, because of the like his style of play. Uh, also, it's great to see uh, youngsters starting to score goals in Super League uh, mm -hmm. this week. Uh, Murat Cem Akpinar, you said, yeah, uh, yeah, scored a goal for Trabzonspor, and we saw also Guan uh, of Besiktas scoring a goal. Mm -hmm. It's great to see uh, youngsters being involved in the league. Yeah, especially Trabzonspor, of course, have been uh, pushing a lot of young talents. Um, both out of necessity, but also out of the fact that they just have a lot of young and exciting players coming up. Um, so I think that's that's pretty much all said would need to be said about this match. Trabzonspor continuing their their good form uh, after a little bit of a shaky start to the second half of the season with that loss against Başakşehir here, um, and of course against Galatasaray too. But they've been picking up steam again lately, and they're definitely a shoe in for fourth place right now. It, it looks like. Uh, they will definitely finish in the top four. Uh, I don't think there's anyone that's going to be able to prevent them from doing so. So let's move on to Saturday. And I know uh, that uh, Umut definitely has a strong opinion on this match. And, and, and Pat too, I think. Sivaspor against Kayseri Spor. A spectacular game for sure. This one ended 1-3 to in favor of the visitors Kayseri Spor. Um, sorry, um... Char Charun Cherry had started the scoring here in the 30th minute and he quickly made it two just three minutes later in the 33rd minute and Hassan, uh, Hassan Hussein Ajar had made it 3-0 in the 45th minute. Erdogan Yeshiljurt made it 1-3 in the 84th minute as a consolation goal for Sivaspor. But again, perhaps a scoreline that does not properly reflect the match. Aruna Kone had missed a penalty in the 15th minute and uh, a very competitive first half hour for sure. And a very lively match where both teams had some chances. Uh, and I, I thought that Sivaspor definitely had the better of that first half an hour, but then... Just quick succession goals from Kayseri Spor kind of took the wind out of uh, Siva Spor's sails. What is your thoughts about the match, Umut? Well, after Robinho's departure, I think Siva Spor uh, is strugg struggling a bit uh, mm -hmm. lately. Uh, also, they're relying on Aruna Kone, but he's not getting any younger. So, uh, it's uh, he's in a bad shape right now. Also missed the penalty. Yeah, the form uh, isn't really there right uh, now. And uh, Hitmate Karaman made a good impact on Kaiserspor uh, after he came, mm -hmm. uh, uh, playing uh, Denis Turich in, in a wider position than he used to play, uh, and relying on his crosses, uh, which he is really good at. Yeah, he got uh, another assist here, I think, to the third yeah, goal. Yeah, yeah, in the third goal, yeah. yeah. Uh, and also Attila Turan uh, made a, a great game. Uh, also assisting a, assisting to Cherry uh, in a like a 60 meter pass in the mm -hmm. second goal. Yeah. A yeah, really good goal. Awesome. Yeah. I think uh, Kaiser Sport deserved it, nonetheless. Yeah, for sure. Uh, do you think maybe, uh, Pat, that Sivaspor kind of banked on the fact, look, we've we're, we've secured our position in the Super League for this season, uh, we're, we're not really interested in going to Europe, so we sell, we're selling off Orbino for $2 million, getting rid of his wages, and, you know, our season is pretty much a success already for staying up, and we'll just see in the summer what we can bring in. Potentially, yeah. I think, like you said, they 
they definitely had a, a good start to the game. It wasn't like um, a complete Kayseri sport domination in yeah. by any sense. Um, I think, you know, big shout out to uh, the Kayseri goalkeeper, Lung, because yeah. uh, he, he definitely um, kept them in the game in the first half. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that um, one-on-one save on Emre Kilinch was really impressive. Yeah. Um, must admit he was at fault for the, the only Siva sport goal, but uh, you know by that time it didn't really matter so much. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, you know, Siva sport for me, they've, they've always been a, a kind of like an Everton team. Like, you know, you never really know what's going to happen with them. Mm-hmm. They're always kind of there, good players, good fan base. Um, so I think, yeah like, yeah, like you said, they probably thought, well, we've had a good season, you know, as long as we um, stick it out, it'll be fine. And, you know, we'll see what happens when they when they come back in uh, well, end of August for the, the start of the next season. And let's move over to the next match, unless and either of you have anything to add. Nope. Not on that match, nope. No, okay. no. Let's move over to the next one, Alanya Sport against Bursa Sport. An important game for Bursa Sport, especially given their precarious position in the relegation zone. Alanya Sport have had a good second half of the season and they don't really have anything left to worry about. And uh, that didn't change after this match as they beat Bursa Sport 1-0 thanks to a Papi Sisse goal in the 72nd minute. It has to be pointed out though, Bursa Spor missed several big opportunities both at 0-0 and at 1-0. They still had one really big opportunity right at the end. Um, but I remember Yusuf Erdogan going one-on-one with the goalkeeper and... and uh, the goalkeeper coming out quite far and and those types of things but you just they seem to lack that sharpness that killer instinct really uh bursa sport kind of look like a wounded animal with not a lot of bite to it at the moment papi sise gets his 13th goal of the season and if i'm not mistaken that makes him second in the top scorer standings behind um by diagne who has double the amount of goals that papi sise has with 26 um, but Pat, what do you think? Bursa Sport, are they going to stay up or? Um, I mean, to be honest, I think like a lot of games left, it really depends on, um, you know, who they've got left mm-hmm. and sticking out the, the wins when they need it. I mean, next game, for example, it's a tough one. I home to Trubs on Sport, who again will be looking for that third place and a slightly easier run into Europe. Um, Way to Kasim Pasha, not easy. Relegation battle with Akisar at home, and then all the way over to the East Erzurum after mm-hmm. that. So it's not going to be, in, and Gostepe as well. So it's, it's, it's not going to be easy for them, to be honest. And I think, you know, not that I have anything against uh, Bursa Spor in particular. It's, you know, Bursa, lovely city and sort of solid fan base of the uh, Texas there. But we all remember, obviously, a few seasons ago that uh, they were kind of played in, kept in the the Super League by Traps on uh, yeah. the expense of Rizespor, mm-hmm. and uh, I don't know whether Karma is going to, to take a bite out of them and let them witness yeah. some. They've been first flirting. League. They they kind of remind me of Hamburg in Germany, you know, flirting with relegation for several seasons and then finally going down of course for Hamburg the first time in history that they went down but Bursa Spor mm-hmm. now this would I believe be the first time since their title in 2010 um, yeah for sure because they haven't gone down since so uh, what do you think Umuta? Are, are Bursa Spor going to manage to stay in it or is Gustav going to be the uh, uh, I think uh, Bursa Spor's fan base is uh, against the team in Mm-hmm. Those kind of circumstances, they can like uh, manage to uh, drop the team's mood yeah. uh, because of the pressure they are giving to the team. Yeah, we saw uh, it a couple of weeks ago with Yusuf Erdogan. Yeah, also in the previous years, we we've seen them uh, fighting inside the bus of the players, uh, fans going inside the bus, hitting mm-hmm. the players. Yeah, like sure. Harun Tekin was involved in the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and Bata- I think Bataja too. I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that was the one of the reasons he left the team, uh, as well. Uh, I think Bursa Spor can manage to stay in the league, uh, but Samet Ayva should uh, make a good impact in the next games. 
uh, he, he will be facing tough teams. Uh, I think uh, I have to tell about Alanya Spor as well. Uh, Ozan Tufan made a great impact to the team after the mm-hmm. transfer window. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Yeah, especially in recent weeks. I mean, he didn't get into the team straight away, but uh, he's been picking up form a little bit later. Yeah, yeah, he is managing to uh, play better every week. Uh, also, Sergen Yalçin uh, was playing really good, uh, uh, managing the team. Mm, that's it, I think, uh, yeah. the about uh, match. So we already, um, Pat already touched on the remaining schedule four for Bursaspor, but it's interesting to note though that uh, playing Erzurum still, playing Akisar still in consecutive weeks, uh, they also play Kasim Pasha, who. Kasim Pesha at this point probably safe, but they've kind of picked up form again recently because they had a terrible start to the second half of the season, but in recent weeks yeah, definitely. They, they haven't lost. So Bursa Spor are still playing all of their relegation rivals. Um, the the 30 match match day 32 fixture between themselves and Gustepe could be crucial. Yeah, um, okay. and, and I think they're kind of unlucky in the fact that they're facing Akisar and, and Erzurum. Um, <laughs> Or not towards the end. Uh, well, they are yeah. towards the end. But if they would have faced those two teams in, like, let's say, week thirty-three and week thirty-four, then both would probably be relegated mathematically already, and it's different. Then now yeah. those two teams are still going to be fighting, you know, for for whatever chance they may have left, and that could make it even extra extra tricky for them. And uh, you know the scrappiness of, of Akisar, we saw it on this match day, and we're going to talk about it later, but they can still uh, be dangerous, so Bursa Spore in a very precarious position for sure. Definitely. So let's move on to the main event of Saturday, that's Galatasaray against Malatya Spore, a repeat of the semi-final earlier in the week in the Turkish Cup. This time it did not end 0-0, however, Galatasaray trashing Malatya Spore 3-0 with three goals coming from Mbaye Diagne, a hat-trick, his first hat-trick in Galtrai colors, but perhaps with a little asterisk next to it, because yeah. both uh, two goals were from the penalty spot, and the other goal was a uh, very <laughs> lucky, def- well, lucky deflection. I'm, I, well, it was really Emre Agbaba who scored, but the but his header deflected off of Diagne, I think, and, and that's why it got awarded to Mbaye Diagne, so kind of a cheap... Uh, hat trick to say the least. But I, I have to say, uh, I've been told that uh, the goal was counted to Emre Akbaba uh, by the referee. Yeah, it was indeed during the game, but uh, I, it was recorded as a goal for Diagne, as far as I can tell. Uh, I'm gonna check on tff.com.org uh, for you just to be sure. But where I checked uh, earlier, uh, BN Sports gave it to uh, gave it to Diagne, so that would be his first official hat trick in Galtrai colors. Um, but let's talk about this, Umut. Of course, you're a season ticket holder. You were in the stands again for this game. What was the difference between the match in the cup and this game? Uh, I think it's always uh, uh, harder for you to face an opponent twice in a small amount of time uh, because they both sides know the weaknesses of the opponents uh, and they can work for the uh, weaker sides. Uh, also, the fact that Linus was playing uh, instead of Emre Tashdemir uh, uh, led the scores uh, during the game, uh, made a huge impact yeah. uh, on the left side of the Galatasaray. Yeah, uh, he won the penalty, and, and right before that, he had already assisted Figuli. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but that definitely. was disallowed for offside. But uh, Linus he, was yeah. involved in the three goals. Uh, mm-hmm. One was, wasn't was given. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh also, uh, I have to tell, uh, Diagne uh, is in a better form than he used to be uh, when he first came. Uh, but still no goals from the play uh, and instead of penalties uh, in a normal goal. Uh, because uh, yeah. he, was, he, he was given uh, a great money from Galatasaray. Mm-hmm. For his transfer, and uh, we are expecting uh, better uh, results from him, but uh, still, uh, just scoring for penalties. Uh, yeah, he's he's slowly turning into being a little bit of a penalty merchant, and and perhaps if the, if there was ever a match to 
had some stats I think this was it he of course moves to 26 goal in the league now and I think it was clear already that he was going to become the top scorer already uh, at the end of the first half of the season when he had scored 20 goals in, in 17 appearances for Kasim Pasha but it is worth pointing out at this time with 26 goals 10 of those have come from the penalty spot that's uh, almost uh, well, that's, that's like what, half that's, of them that's 37% or something of his total is, is from penalties at this point. Uh, but it does have to be said still, 16 goals. Uh, maybe if you don't count the one uh, that, that that he scored today, 15 goals from open play, that's still uh, <laughs> yeah, more than anyone else. Yeah, it was a deflection, but... <laughs> yeah, but I mean, still, still more goals than any other player in the league has scored. From, uh, so, uh, I mean, this, like I said, Papi Sisse with, is in second place there with 13 goals. Um, but so far, not the most impressive uh, start for Diagne, but he gets the, the goals and that's important for him to build up that confidence and to get more and more in form. And, and he is slowly getting there, as you said. Uh, Pat, what did you think of, of Diagne's hat-trick and uh, the result? Did it surprise you at all? Um, no, I don't think the result at all surprised me. Obviously, with um, the, the Galatasaray playing before Basakshi, you know, the, then they weren't going to squander their chances like they did in the cup. Um, and I think, you know, although luck and uh, favour were with Galatasaray this game, I think if, if they hadn't had those penalty calls and the, the fact that goal hadn't gone in, they would have ground out a victory anyway. I think this is, you know, it's one that they can't lose really. I think moving forward, again, all they're waiting for is Basak Chihir to slip up. Yeah, very true, and that could very well happen next week, uh, but we'll get to that later. Um, let's move on to Sunday results. Kasim Pasha beats Erzurum Spor 2-1, and, and Erzurum Spor, they fired Mehmet Özdilek a couple of weeks ago, and, and they've lost everything since, and that came right after a 1-1 draw against Galatasaray. So really makes that decision even more puzzling perhaps uh, mm. and the, the the striker that never scores Bengali Koita scored twice in this match in the 29th minute he opened the scoring 1-0 but Samuel Eduk tied things up in the 61st minute scoring against his ex-club Kasim Pasha and then Bengali Koita again in the 76th minute to make it 2-1 to Kasim Pasha and, and that one really just pushes Erzurum <sighs> further in the relegation uh, battle. I mean, they're, they're pretty much done for at this point. They need um, six points just to go equal with, with Bursa Spor and, and then, of course, hope that Gustepe don't get more points. So it's going to be very tough for them to, to stay up still, which is a shame, I think. I, I've enjoyed Erzurum Spor. Um, there was a late far decision where there was a potential penalty for Erzurum Spor. The referee went to check out the footage but decided not to award a penalty there. So, Pat, I'm going to throw it to you first. Did you think that was a penalty, perhaps, for Erzurum Spor? Could they have gotten the point at the end, or do you agree with the referee's decision? I think I agree with the referee's decision at the end of the day. Um, I think the game in general was quite close. Um, the I think Kasper, they had a disallowed goal as well in the early on. Is that right, from recollection? Yeah, I believe uh, believe so, but uh, it's eluding me right now. Uma, do you recall whether? Well, I haven't watched the game to be honest. Hmm. Okay, then uh, not much left to be added there. Then, <laughs> but yeah. uh, please continue, Pat. And I think um, at the end of the day, I think Kasim Pasha deserved the victory. I think mm -hmm. they were slightly on top, and again, you know, looking at Erzurum. Just gonna have a quick look to see who they've got next. I think they they do have a couple of games with the lower league. Uh, and they, they've got yeah, they've played everyone home. at the top of the league. I think. Yeah, so they to be honest, I, I don't know. They they don't seem quite down and out, if, especially if they look ahead. So their next games are bottom of the table clash against Aksa in Erzurum. Mm -hmm. they then have Gustepe away. And obviously, we'll get on to what happened with Gustav in the last home game. Mm -hmm. um, they have Bursaspor at home as well. So that's um, three games against direct rivals. Exactly, yeah. And if they win and all you, three. <laughs> you know, well, who knows what would happen then. Yeah. Slightly tough uh, games. Where they've got um, Fenerbahce at home and then Kayseri Spor away at their last two games. 
not tricky. So it could come out to the final um, game for them. But yeah, you know, neither uh, Gustavo nor Borussia Sport, I guess, can be too confident in terms of what, what kind of team that they'll face, especially if they get a win against Akisara, um next Monday. Yeah, very true. So very interesting weeks to come up in the relegation zone for sure. But with 22 points, it's going to be extremely tough for Erzurum. Regardless, they're, they, they're in positions where they have to win every single game uh, mm. that comes up now. So let's move over to that, to that other relegation candidate, to number 16 in the league table, Gustepe, who faced number 18 uh, in the league table at the time of this match. But Gustepe, with another of those almost final chance types of games, or at least one of those must-win matches... They didn't do it again. They lost at home 1-0 to Akisar. With a goal coming very late through Helder Barbosa in the 88 minutes. And up until the final 20 or so minutes, I thought Gustepe really were the better side and deserved the win. But Akisar, in those final couple of minutes, they really came up. And um, they, they were dangerous a couple of times. And at the end of the day, uh, perhaps even a deserved victory for them. Because Gustepe, despite having a lot of half chances maybe they couldn't really uh, create 100% scoring opportunities Lukac with a lot of saves but those were usually from shots from distance and, and Gustepe just look a bit toothless uh, to be fair Umut you're an Izmir native if I'm not mistaken you yeah, have yeah. a lot of sympathy for Gustepe and uh, what's your feeling regarding their current situation well, I'm upset that they were defeated uh, in their uh, own stadium. Uh, and I've been expecting a better result from them. Uh, but uh, uh, Akisar Sport played really well. And uh, I think Kokalic uh, in the defense made some uh, great uh, tackles uh, early on in the game, preventing the goals. Uh, also, Minan Lukac uh, of Akisar Sport uh, made a great impact. Uh, but uh, in the game, uh, Gustave was uh, really poor on finding chances uh, in front of goal. Uh, uh, Yasin Ostekin and Hale Akbunar uh, failed to feed Cameron Jerome uh, by their crosses. Uh, also, uh, Nabil Gilas went on uh, on the late stages, but uh, he also failed to find the net. Uh, so I have. Uh, next games uh, will be better for Gustape, but uh, still uh, they're in a hard stage uh, about the relegation. I think that's it. Yeah. What about you, Pat? Were you surprised by this result? Yes, I think so. I think in terms of what Gustape needed to do, especially being um, in their home stadium, um, I was expecting to at least score, not, to not even get anything on the score she was quite disappointing um Yassin for example he he missed a couple of good chances there's one where he yeah had a, the perfect opportunity to you know place it quite well or at least do a sort of half volley but he absolutely skied it mm -hmm. and um you know I'm sure when the final was went he was kicking himself even more for, for yeah, not for putting sure. that away because it was uh, you know one of those things where as we'll, we'll uh, talk a bit more about when we discuss Fenerbahce that you know you have to score regardless of how much time you think you might have. Yeah, and, and and I think we've brought it up a few times already on the podcast. But Gustepe's main issue seems to be that they don't have a scoring forward. They had Adis Jaovic last season. They had Dembaba before that, or was it the season before that they had Jaovic? But I mean they've had. Scoring goal score or uh, scoring strikers before, and right now they are relying a lot on Yasin Ustekin. They were hoping that Serdar Gurlech could bring in some extra goals coming in in January, um, but that that hasn't really happened. Yasin's gotten a fair share amount of goals, but it's not enough to to get them those points in these types of matches. They just need a striker that scores goals, and Nabil Gilas he got a really important goal a couple of weeks ago, but not really what they need and I think that's been their main issue the fact that they don't have a striker 
that they can rely on for those goals. And, and there's been many of these games now where it kind of had to happen for them and it just hasn't because they create pressure, but they don't really create, create clear-cut goal opportunities. And at the end of the day, they're probably more of a counter team. And at this point for them, it's not about countering anymore. It's about controlling the match, controlling possession, creating chances. And that's not happening when the the opponent they're playing isn't leaving a lot of space and behind the defense. Because that's where Yasin and, and Serdar shine. But it's not happening for them right now. So they're definitely in a precarious position. Uh, and I keep using that word a lot, but that's just the way it is. Let's move over to the next one. Ankara Gujur against Fenerbahce. Two teams who were on equal points. Both had 31 points heading into this match. Um, and this was really kind of about getting away more, making more distance away from the relegation zone. But both teams, I think, were kind of in a position already where they didn't need to worry about that too much anymore. Um, they were four points out of relegation, uh, out of the relegation zone if I'm not mistaken, and uh, this one was more about perhaps even still getting a European ticket. Um, this one ended 1-1, though. Tyler Boyd had gotten the scoring started in the 42nd minute, and Hassan Ali Calderim continues his good run of form by equalizing in the 67th minute. But uh, no more goals in this match, but we did see two red cards right at the end, uh, one for Hector Canteros in the 90th minute and in that same uh, position Mehmet Ikeji got a red card as well uh, basically they got into a, a huge pushing shoving contest I think Canteros maybe uh, hit Mehmet in the face after Mehmet uh, came in really aggressively and that happened all because of uh, one of Fenerbahce's players stayed down injured and I'm not sure if it was Canteros that took him down but uh, definitely Ikeji trying to defend his teammate there and uh Maybe overreacted a little bit, but um, yeah, two red cards. And, and for Ekechi, that means no derby match. Uh, and for Kantaros, uh, that means uh, no match against um, Erzurum Spor, I believe. So, uh, yeah. No, sorry, that's not right. I'm mixing stuff up right now. Um, but no points. Uh, just a point for each. But Fenerbahce, perhaps... For me, at least, I thought they deserved more, or at least they should have gotten more. But like you already alluded to, Pat, perhaps not taking their chances. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the, the phrase in Turkish here is atamayanlara uh, atarlar. Because, uh, which I hope you're forgetting that we have probably non Turkish speakers in the audience, is like they score against those who can't. It's probably the very rough translation there. Uh, it's just another game where Fenerbahce have not been able to to take their chances. Yes, there were maybe some penalty calls, some things in the box that happened that weren't given. But that's that's life, I guess. But, uh, you know, when you have the, the number of chances you do, you get into the good positions that you do, and you only come away with one goal... You know these things can happen, um, and it's just it's very frustrating as as a fan to know that we get so close. But I guess to some extent, like Gustepe, we we just don't have that reliable striker that you can go to that we've had in seasons gone by that we know can have that killer instinct to to finish off games. Yeah, I mean, in the past, you you had guys like Musa So, who not necessarily scored an insane amount of goals every season, but you knew he was going to get his fifteen goals in, and yeah, he would. And you knew in these types of games where you did create chances after chances, you may miss a few, but eventually there's going to end up one in the back of the net with a guy like So, with a guy like Kite, uh, with those types of players, and maybe that's indeed something that Fenerbahce are missing. Not so much yeah. that they're missing quality per se up top. I, I wouldn't say individual quality, but they're just missing that type of, of a player. There's not really anyone there that you're looking towards that's going to get you a lot of goals in the season. I mean, of exactly. course, you'd, you'd want Soldado to score, but Valbuena is not really a scoring player. Uh, I mean, he's going to get a few, but he's not a 10-plus goal season player. Uh, yeah. Victor Moses isn't that type of a player. Mehmet Ikichi theoretically could be... And I think he's been one of the most dangerous men that they have. Also in this match, he was dangerous. But yeah, it's just missing that little bit of a, you know, like an Oljai Shahan type, a Yasin Ustikin type. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, you know that that maybe somebody who's less flashy but gets at the end yeah. of those balls. Or even the kind of super sub, a la semi centric, for example. Yeah. Just to have that that person, you know, you can put them for the last fifteen minutes. He's going to run around a bit. He's going to sort of cause the defense to worry. Mm -hmm. We we just don't really have that, you know. Just looking on uh, the sort of lineup right now, Bar um, Soldado was obviously playing. We had no out and out strikers that could come on to to you know either yeah. add someone to back him up. But obviously they had the red card. But I think um, you know our last substitution would be made before then, and you know without um, anyone to back uh, Soldado up. You're really, you know, worried. You know, what happens if he had the red card and it hadn't been the 93rd minute, it'd been the 63rd minute? Mm -hmm. Then you would have, we would have been playing with a kind of, you know, four six zero to some extent. Yeah, um, and I think Sebastian Frey was injured for this one, right? Yes, yeah, something and then, like that. Yeah, and Slimani has been dropped from the team entirely. Yeah. So it's a. Uh, yeah, heading into next week's Derby match, it's going to be interesting to see. No Mehmet Ekichi, that's probably a big miss, but yeah. of course uh, Miha Zajic is there, and he's been good as well, and he's been yes. showing promise. So, uh, Fortunately, not... no yellow card to Skirtle either, because I was, I was a bit worried that he'd uh, pick something up, but hmm. yeah, he's going to be there next week, hopefully. We, we saw a couple of weeks ago, of course, that he can get, can get away with a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> also, how do you guys rate the uh, performances of Elif Elmas showing in the national team, but not reaching the, that kind of level in the, his team, Fenerbahce? I think he plays a very different role for the national team, doesn't he? He plays in a more offensive role. He's put in a more of a leadership position. I think at Fenerbahce, he's expected to do more dirty work. Uh, and I think that, that when we look at his 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 playing style, I think when it comes to his defensive capabilities, I'm not convinced, if I'm honest. I mean, he, he makes a lot of silly tackles sometimes and takes stupid yellow cards. Uh, I think that somehow that's not really his, his, his forte, so to speak. I don't know if you agree, Pat? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure on him, of course. Um, when you know, a young player comes into a team and, you know, obviously Venomacho not having the best of seasons uh, mm -hmm. by any lengths. Um, however, you know, I think with time and with the with decent coaching, you know, if he can evolve into his position. You know, if you look at, for example, from uh, my English team, um, Gareth Bale with Tottenham, for example, you know, you had a quite a young Gareth Bale who came into the, the Tottenham team was seen as a kind of, you know, Potential something for the future. Yeah, move and he played as a fullback in the beginning. Yeah, right? move from like sort of a left back. I think um, went up up the field. I'm not saying obviously that. Um, kind of like Arda Elmas, when he played at Manisa. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm not saying Elmas is suddenly going to move into like a you know right back whatever mm -hmm. position. But no, but he still has to come to into his own and discover exactly, what's yeah. his best position in the pitch. Maybe yeah, sure. I definitely uh, agree with that. Um, I think for me, the thing I always think of when I see him, I think he's very mature for his age, despite those stupid yellow cards that might be a sign of not the experience and maturity. But I do feel like when he's on the ball, he looks like a confident, mature player. Um, but I always feel like he's an, he's an 18, 19-year-old guy that plays like a 25-year-old guy, but not an exceptional 25-year-old, if you... Yeah get what I'm, where I'm coming from. So I'm not sure whether Elif is really... I think... I don't know if... I might be wrong. I don't have the impression of him that he's ever going to be an exceptional player. But I do think he's going to be a, a good, solid player for Fenerbahce. But I might be wrong. He, he might turn into an, an, an amazing player still. So we'll have to wait and see. And in fact, I have, I, I have that opinion on another player, which I'll come back to in a bit. Um, Umut, your thoughts on this match? Uh, I think uh, in the Fenerbahce match, are we talking? Yes. Uh, I think Fenerbahce deserved it, but uh, uh, Ankara Gücü put on a well effort uh, on the pitch. Uh, also, uh, playing Mehmet Topal uh, made Fenerbahce uh, like uh, being less creative in front mm -hmm. of goal because he was defensive minded. Uh, also, Dirar up front uh, made it difficult. 
for them to find a goal. Uh, they found the goal from Hassan Ali Calderum uh, getting in front of goal uh, with a Soldado's assist uh, playing as a target man in that position. And that's where uh, you expect the left winger maybe to come in, but we're we're seeing that that we, that that Hassan Ali who has to come in there as the left back, and it's not the first time that we've seen it. It's not just a, a rare occurrence here. I think that's what something we were talking about earlier, where Fenerbahce kind of lo- lack that guy that maybe not the flashiest player, but you know that type of a winger that can get a goal and can get the yeah. end of passes and stuff like that. I think Gerard should be playing a right wi- a right back, uh, like how Hassan Ali plays because he likes to attack and he has a decent defensive effort mm-hmm. uh, during the games. Uh, Isla uh, is good but in, for offensive uh, things uh, you need more from a player. So I think Gerard uh, could be a better selection uh, for the right back position. Okay. Uh, also uh, Ekiji uh, being sent off is a bad uh, news for Fenerbahce for the derby uh, because the creative mind uh, he is uh, and I think Mihal Zaitz uh, is going to be replaced uh, for Ek- uh, Ekiji for in the derby yeah he will replace him. Uh, yeah also uh, Elf Elmas is an option uh, yeah. but uh, I don't think he has a composure to play a big game like it is uh, mm-hmm. as as a derby in Turkey, uh, but uh, I think he will uh, find some uh, time uh, in the end of the game. Uh, I think uh, Arsenal will give him a chance during the yeah. game. Uh, also, how do you rate Tolga Arslan uh, in the I, game? I I I, <laughs> I have to admit I uh, might have been a little bit of a guilty pleasure of mine because. The goal from Ankara Guju that came directly from Tolgai losing the ball in a sloppy way in midfield. And that's the thing I always hated about him when he was playing for Besiktas is that nonchalance at times in midfield where he could give away the ball and, and, and that would lead to a dangerous counterattack. And I think he is, when he is focused, when he's uh, completely with his head in the game, he's probably one of the best uh, top three central midfielders in the league, but he he has he has a huge concentration issue. Like he cannot focus for ninety minutes. I feel like, um, but I think he has shown quality for Fenerbahce for sure. What do you think, mm. Pat? Yeah, no, I agree. I think um, he's he's definitely been um, a good signing for us. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see how we he moves. Working forward, just making sure that you know once the kind of honeymoon period is finished, moving to next season, that he's still got that kind of desire to do well. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, you know, I'm looking forward to to, to seeing what what happens next. Really, um, you know, not just for for him, but uh, for a lot of players. I think uh, I think since my last appearance on the show, um, read a lot about obviously the the future of Fenerbahce to some extent in terms of what we do next. Uh, obviously, there's this Fener All um, mm-hmm. campaign to, to, to raise money from the fans basically, as well. Basically, Feda 2.0. <laughs> yeah, basically. Uh, or what was the last one? Um, Fener Ichin something. There was, Fener there was All. One. That's yeah, a new one, yeah. Th- this is the Fener All one. There was one before which uh, the name escapes me. Um, but, yeah, I, th- I think we might see more of these kind of whether pre-season or mid-season signings, um, because you know now we're in a, a similar situation as um, what was it the Oakland A's in uh, Moneyball, where not just Fenerbahce but uh, you know likes of Besiktas and Galatasaray as well will be needing to to look into the stats to see who's undervalued, who might be a, a good signing for cheap, mm. who's not going to cost us millions of euros per year on um wages to, to you know to stay afloat really yeah and that's something you have with Elliot, for example i mean he's not yeah. on, on big wages and stuff like that uh, i wanted to ask you pat because i asked burak this in regard to the, the national team sure. um is it maybe time to start thinking about cutting 
Topalus. Do you think he's past uh, his expiration date? I think it's interesting, yeah, because, you know, he's a kind of standard, um, well, ever since I've been supporting Fenerbahce to some extent, he, he, you know, he's been there mm-hmm. uh, in his defensive midfielder position, um, had a, a nice duo with um, De Souza for a few seasons before he left us. Um, and it will be, to be honest, it'll be strange if and when he goes because Bar to some extent, Hassan Ali Calderman, you know, Volkan as well in goal. You know, for me anyway, that will be the sort of end of the, the generation that I'm familiar with to some extent. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, what I've been thinking and perhaps even said on the last show um, is... Fenerbahce have really missed, or had an identity crisis. That's that's probably the, the best way to explain it. You know, they brought in lots of players at the beginning of the season, um, a lot of sort of um, foreign players as well, um, who may not be as familiar as Turkish football as, um, you know, let's say buying people from some of the other well, foreign players from the, some of the other Turkish teams as well. And I think ultimately, especially in the you know the, the beginning of the season, that really had an impact in terms of not being able to kind of create something around which the team needed to play, if you get me. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, to some extent, Volkan, to some extent, Hassan Ali. But I think, you know... There needs to be a skeleton, of... and, and you can't... I mean, Galatasaray proved me wrong on this one, but you you can't really put 11 new players on the pitch and say, hey, yeah. Go. You know that, that that doesn't work usually. It, sure. it, somehow it worked for Galatasaray last season, but nine yeah, times also the it the, won't. Uh, like twenty twelve season, uh, when the uh, Terim first came, uh, mm. he put a uh, new set of players on the field. Yeah. Uh, just uh, like Hakan Balta was from the previous season, mm-hmm. uh, all the team was gone, but he grabbed the title. Yeah, but under, I mean. With rivals severely, um, I mean, you, you, you basically you hurt Trabzon just by taking Selçuk away there. Egemen left as well. I think Burak left a year after, didn't he? Uh, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, Trabzon were weakened. Fenerbahce were going through the whole match-fixing thing. Also, uh, we, t- we took Engin Baitar from Trabzon's part. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, and he was pretty important that, that previous season for them. So, I mean, uh, yeah, but you also, at, at in the process, you, you kind of uh, weakened the, the rivals, especially Trabzon Sport. So, uh, yeah, I mean, but usually, you know, changing a lot of players doesn't really work all that well. I think for Fenerbahce, perhaps it was more of a, of a, of a situation of they put off transitioning for too long and then they try to do it all in one transfer period and, and mm. that just doesn't work but I think guys like Volkan we can say probably that he's been over his expiration date for a while now yeah Topal has been declining for the last two three seasons um and and I mean Hassan Ali Kaldegum he's, he's still not that old I mean how old is he like 28 29 so yeah he's probably a bit younger than me yeah. I think. He, he's still got um, a couple of seasons in him for sure and I think he's playing one of his best seasons if I'm honest despite yeah. the fact that Fenerbahce aren't doing so well scored a blinder against Besiktas yeah and he scored another good goal here and, 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 yeah. and he's been he's been one of those guys that has kind of been putting the team on his back uh, at times and he, that's something you don't really expect from a left back sure also, yeah, he scored just, in a national team, if yeah, I remember yeah, correctly. Yeah, scored his first goal for Turkey against Albania, if I'm not mistaken, or was it against uh, Moldavo? Moldavo, I think. But let's move over to the Başakşehir here against Konya Spor match. The league leaders played Konya Spor um, on the main event slot, so to speak, on Sunday, and they won this match two to nil. Goals coming from Maxio Mosoro in the 50th minute and Indian Vistja. In the 69th minute, Elgeo Elia had already scored in the first half, but that goal got disallowed for offside through VAR. But all in all, a pretty simple victory for Bershakshir. Konya Spor never really put much of a tr- of, of, of threat towards Bershakshir until it was already 2-0. Then they started poking their heads at the window a little bit, but pretty straightforward win for Bershakshir as they have been getting throughout the season and... Uh, they don't really show any signs of slowing down. Umut, how hopeful are you that you'll still be able to catch 
Bishakshir? Well, it's a difficult uh, task for Galatasaray uh, because uh, not being beaten uh, on the run and expect Bashakshir to suffer uh, during that time. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's really difficult, uh, but I hope we achieve it. <laughs> what do you think, Pat? Yeah, I think um, a lot will come out in terms of what happens next weekend. Uh, quite a crunch weekend for, for all teams, really. Just having a quick look to see who they've got coming up as Bishop well. Dish. They play Besiktas next they week play, Saturday? Yeah, they, obviously, yeah, they played the, the, the away to Besiktas next Saturday. So in terms of who they've got left, they do have Galatasaray away in their penultimate game, mm -hmm. which yeah. is pretty crucial. And I think Bar they that, still play Riza Sport too? Yes. So they've That's got a... two home games, uh, Riza Sport and Gostepe, away to Sivas Sport, back home for Ankara Gaju, then around the corner to Galatasaray, uh, the sort of end of men, then final game to the boys from the beach, Alanya Sport. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know that that uh, well, it it's could not, come right down to the line, yeah, really. It's not really an easy schedule for sure. Um, they've they, mm, I think their schedule has been quite. Um, I think they had a, had a good schedule to start off with. I think it's always good to have some easy games early on, not having really big tests early on. Uh, that could be a disadvantage too, but I think for a team like Bashakshi who are already that familiar with each other, who don't really... They just need to pick up some steam, and I think for them the scheduling has been really good in that regard. But now they've got some tough games coming up. Uh, yeah. Of course, they did have Trabzon Spore early on, so that, that was a test, and they, they passed that with flying colors. But um, it's still possible... But then Galtrai are going to need a favor from Besiktas yes. for sure. Um, I don't think there's much to add to this match, uh, except for one more thing. How quiet is it in the Besiktas Stadium when they score? <laughs> it's so, so <laughs> sad. It's so sad. Yeah. Um, let's move over to Monday. And this was probably, without a doubt, uh, the show stealer of the weekend. Chaiku Rizespor... Besiktas, 2-7. to seven. What a match. And this scoreline, believe me, does not reflect the match either. Riza Sport weren't just there to take a beating. They played a really good game up until a certain point. But uh, let's go over to the scoring procedures. Domagoj Vida had opened the scoring in the 8th minute from Adam Leic corner. He headed it home as he was unmarked in the box. Adam Leic then doubled the scoring in the 14th minute with a spectacular curler in the 14th minute to make it 2-0. Vedat Muric pulled one back in the 43rd minute for Rizespor Spore going into the halftime break 1-2. But Burak Yilmaz got his goal um, in the 63rd minute, 64th minute pardon, uh, to make it 1-3 to Besiktas. Mohamed, uh, sorry. Mohamed Abaroun had pulled one back in the 70th minute, putting Riza Sport back in the match, but Guven Yalcin, who had just come on as a substitute replacing Burak Yilmaz, scored the 2-4 just a minute later, again off an Adam Leic assist. Then Adam Leic stepped up again himself in the 78th minute with a free kick, and he put, curled it over the wall, beating Gokhan Akan and uh, making it 2-5. Then Guven Yalcin again in the 82nd minute, with the sixth goal for Besiktas in his second, and that was Adam Leic's third assist. And then right at the end, Guven Yalcin getting on the score sheet again, this time assisted by Dorokan Tokus, who had also assisted Adam Leic's goal, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Adam Leic's first goal. And that was a, a, a very a controversial goal in a way, because the net wasn't properly attached to the goal and the, the ball went in but then went straight out and so the, the referee hadn't actually seen that it was a goal and if it wasn't for VAR we probably wouldn't have gotten this beauty uh, but uh, thanks to VAR it did get awarded and the final scoreline reads 2-7 to seven. this is the first time since 2003 that Besiktas scored 7 goals in a wow. league match uh, that happened against Gustepe in a 7-3 victory on the 19th of March 2003. I remember that date vividly because that was the centenary anniversary match 
that Besiktas played. Uh -huh. I even have a match-worn jersey of that game. Um, oh, wow. But Adam Leitch with two goals, three assists, and uh, he now has seven goals and seven assists in 18 starts, a total of 20 league games. Guven Yelchin scores his first professional career hat-trick at the age of 20 and three months, and he has now five goals in total in the season. Vedat Muric and Burak Yilmaz are now both on 12 goals for this season, which puts them in uh, third place, a shared third place uh, in the top score standings. Um, but like I said, Chaiko Ruzespor played a very good game. Uh, if you only watched the highlights and didn't watch the full match here, you probably think, ah, oh, that's a pretty straightforward win for Besiktas, a deserved win for Besiktas. And yes, sure, a deserved win for Besiktas. 11 shots, on, uh, 11 shots and all 11 on target. But it should be said, Chaiko Rizespor pushed Besiktas back for the majority of the match and were really looking good. Uh, they also had, I think, two goals disallowed for offside, uh, both correct calls. Um, but yeah, Rizespor definitely coming out of this match looking like a, a beaten dog, perhaps. And they had only conceded five goals in the second half of the season, now seven in one game. But I just kind of feel sorry for Rizespor because they did not deserve this type of a trashing given the match that they put on the mat. Uh, Pat, I'm going to throw to you first your opinion and uh, sure. your thoughts on this game. Um, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with you. It's, again, it's one of those games where you look at the scoreline and think, wow, they've absolutely trounced them, one-way traffic. But no, it was it's quite opposite, actually. And um, you know, obviously, if you look at when the goals went in, it was just a moment where, you know, Reza Sport just lost it and uh, got a little bit out of hand, as they say. Um, you know, Reza Sport, they, they played quite well, actually. You know, uh, six shots on target, for example. Dominated possession, actually, as well. Um, around 60%, it says. Yeah, they had 19 total shots. Yeah, and, you know, they've done... Well, they're on 34 points at the moment, so it's not like, you know, that like a lot of the clubs, they're also they're looking up as much as they're looking down and yeah you know 7-2 sounds like um a route whereas actually it was um you know it was, it was a close game until uh until the end there what what do you think umut about this game uh well uh adam leitch uh performed really well uh, i really admire him uh because uh always surprised me with it with the quality he possesses uh like both the game uh, just by himself uh, with three assists and two goals and his first goal was quite brilliant uh, with the curve he put on the ball uh, yeah, even made ESPN Sports Center and I, I don't know how often that ha happens for uh, a goal or a moment in the Turkish Super League but I think that's quite of a, a, a unicum yeah uh, also uh, I kind of like the uh, game uh, with youngsters being put on the uh, field by Chanel Güneş, uh, Dorkan Tokos, uh, Rudvan Yilmaz uh, also made yeah. his first appearance for the club. Uh, uh, I think it was uh, two minutes of playing time he had. Uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah, also Gwen Yalçın made a hat-trick uh, for, he, he, for the first time in his career. Uh, really good effort from him. Uh, uh, I think that's that. Uh, what do you think of, of Guven Yalçin, uh, Umut? Would you rate him as a... What, what type of a level of a talent would you rate him at? Do you think he's going to be uh, the next Burak Yilmaz? Or do you think he's going to be maybe the next Umut Bulut? Or more of a Mustafa Pektimek level player? Or wh where do you see him in, in the next four or five years, maybe? Uh, I think it's uh, quite... Uh, unclear uh, mm -hmm. t to be honest because uh, I've ex experienced the same kind of things about uh, Sinan Gümüş uh, mm -hmm. uh, like previous years in the previous years but but, uh, but, but Sinan Gümüş is a definitely an above average player I would say I, I think that maybe the expectations are higher for him but I think there's definite clear quality there to be seen and he's not just another player I think. Yes, but uh, he's quite uh, failed to be a consistent player on the pitch uh, because yeah. one week he's uh, like a star player, but uh, in the other times uh, he's 
not there. Uh, you can't see him on the field like mm-hmm. a ghost. Uh, uh, also, uh, the fact that uh, Guan Yalchin is better from Sinan Gumish is like he is good on both feet. Uh, but uh, Sinan Gumish on more reliant on his left foot and not never I, using I, the right foot of himself. I've seen I've seen Guven uh, put in some poor shots. Trust me. Um, but what? So the jury is still out on him, in your opinion, Umut. But what do you think, Pat? Where, where Pat? Where do you see Guven Yelchin in, in a couple of years? Do you, what type of a level player do you expect him to become? Sure. Um, not so much where you think he could potentially go but where do you expect him to go yeah i think um you know not just a bit him but if we look back to what we're talking about to do with um elif elmas for example it's just the mm-hmm. the amount of support that they get from from the coaching staff really and mixing that in with i guess just the pressure of um of, of well being a football a modern footballer really yeah. um you know if you look again back to um Ozan Tufan, for example, you know, fair play to him. He's, he's doing some good things down in um, Alanya, and um, you know, I think he's really making a bit more of an effort to to get back into the game because there was a player very young, you know, Bruce was born then over to Fenerbahce, but for whatever reason, never really managed to kind of ride that wave forward to you know, maybe even becoming a a, a Genghis, for example, and getting a, a move to Europe. Yeah, never um, reached this potential as Fenerbahce. Yeah, and you know, maybe hopefully he'll be more like um, Genghis rather than you know, Anozan or I'm sure there are other players that have done similar, really. But it's just you know, making sure that his his coaching staff, but also his agents and the people that are around, manage his personality as much as um, as much as his you know physical and uh, technical side. Yeah, uh, personally, I, I, I uh, huh. I think it's difficult too. I even I had we had a discussion before the game where uh, with my with my Besiktas friends and we were and I was I literally said to them, uh, look at look at the bench. Riza have a better bench than we do. The only player who can make an impact on the bench is Kagawa. Uh, and and then we talked a little bit. And then someone said, ah, maybe Guven. I said, yeah, but to me he's not. You know, I he proved me wrong completely because he came in and scored a hat trick, but. I, for for Guven, I still I've had the feeling early on I said oh, he might have some quality, but he kind of disappointed me then later on. But it has to be said he kind of got put into a, a left winger position where he had to do a lot of dirty work and he worked very hard. Um, but I for me like Umut, the, the jury is still definitely out. I think there there is some talent there, but I'm I'm a little bit worried that he might not have the physical ability to be a proper lone striker. He's not he's not tall. Uh, not particularly tall, at least. Uh, he's not particularly fat. He's quick, but not really super fast or anything like that. So I think he might be able to be a Jenk Tosun type of player, but I think he's lacking that little bit of extra to be a, a top top striker, like for you know Turkish league standards. Like Burak has that speed, has that, or at least had that. Still, kind of has that speed, those runs, um, and and. Cenk was always the type of player, you know, he, he was he was kind of okay in everything, but not superb at anything. And I think Guven might be a similar mold of player, so I, I don't know where he's going to go. I hope he's going to get plenty of playing time in the coming seasons, and, and hopefully we'll see. Um, but yeah, not much left to talk about, except we already touched on Adam Leitch stealing the show, really, in this match. Uh, with three goal, uh, two goals and three assists. Um, and that brings us to the next segment, which is goal of the week in the Turkish Super League. Guys, I'm going to run you down one by one. Which, for you, was the goal of the week? Pat, going to throw to you first. So, I know obviously there's a, probably a, a clear favorite, but I'm going to go for a, a bit of a different one in terms of a, a good technical goal. Yeah, that's um, very much appreciated. And this was actually the very first goal of the weekend. Um mm-hmm. Dokara for um, uh, Antalya Sport. Yeah. Um, just because I think in the build-up it was the assist from, and I can just get this up, um, Özmert. Hakan Özmert, yeah. Yes. You know, he, he perfectly read the, the play. He saw that the the, um, the Trabzon defenders, Trabzon Sport defenders were, were were sleeping, pounced on a sort of loose ball to some extent, 
then did a nice loop pass over, um, and it was obviously well finished by Decor. It could have ended up in the stands, but uh, ended up in the back of the net. Um, so yeah, I just think for reading that game and taking that chance, it went from a position where it was like, so you know, what are Travis and Spall going to do with this ball? To suddenly, you know, uh, completely switching around the game and uh, you know taking that early lead. And again, like we like we spoke about earlier, it was a game that if you know if the ball had gone a little bit to the right um, early on in the the first half as well it could have been yeah. 2 nil and yeah, I mean, I don't know. for sure um Umut, what about you what's your goal of the week well i'm between uh gwen yelchin's goal and with the Lions' first goal uh, they're both really good goals uh, but i think the uh, fact that Even the third goal right yeah, yeah yeah third goal i think the fact that the ball went out of bounds uh, stole the a magical kind of thing about the goal. <laughs> yeah, because you ha- you have to see the ball uh, bouncing into the net. Uh, uh, I think uh, I'm going to choose the lights goal because the curve was like really good, uh, magical. Roberto Carlos uh, esque. Yeah, yeah, um, more like Henry kind. <laughs> Uh, so basically, B in Sports put it, put forward the same question: goal of the week to the fans, and the, they, their four choices were uh, Suleiman Dukara, Edin Vizca, Adam Ljajic, and Guven Yalcin. Those were the two, the, the four picks from um, from B in Sports. Uh, and I'm going to have to side with Umut here. I think Adam Ljajic's goal uh, has to take it. It was uh, spectacular, um, and like I said already earlier, ended up on ESPN. Uh, even so, uh, I think that 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 goes uh, uh, that, that does show how uh, good the goal was. Uh, but let's move over to the league table. Bashakchi here, still the league leaders, of course, with 61 points after their victory. Galatasaray firmly in second place with 55 points, six points behind the leaders. Then a five point drop off to Besiktas, who are on 50 points now. Trabzonspor are firmly in fourth position though with 46 points points just four points behind Besiktas and they still play each other so there still could be some changes there but uh, I don't think there will be any changes in regards to the teams that are in the top four those seem to be set in stone because the drop off from Trabzonspor uh, who are in fourth to number five which is shared by three teams Kasim Pasha Alanya Spor and Malatya Spor who are all on 37 points that's a nine point drop off right there then let's move down to the bottom half of the table in 13th and 14th position, Fenerbahce and Angregju are on 32 points after their draw. Then there's a 4-point drop-off to 15th place with Bursaspor on 28 points. And then another point drop-off to 16th place with Gustepe on 27. Akisar are now in 17th place with 24 points following their victory on the road in Izmir. And then Erzurumspor, after their defeat, remain on 22 points and they are now dead bottom on the table. Uh, yeah basically exchanging spots with Agisar. So that's really pretty much it. We've already touched on the relegation battle in our match discussions. There's not really much to be said uh, in regards of of the table, uh, at the top of the table. So let's move over to previewing next week. And there's two really big games next week. One of which is uh, the Besiktas Başakşehir game. This is going to be important in regards to the title race. Uh, and also in regards to Besiktas' uh, position in the table, are they still going to make a run for that second Champions League spot? The title seems to be out of the question, but they're still very much in the running for second place. Um, and, and they also have to look back at Trabzonspor, uh, who are breathing down their necks with just a four-point gap there. So first up is uh, that match, Besiktas against Başakçı here. And then, of course, the cracker, who I think uh, everyone is looking forward to, Fenerbahce against Galatasaray. Galatasaray looking for their first away win in Kadikoy since 1999. That's literally the previous century, folks. That's been... How long has that been? (laughs) That's been 20 years this year. So, could Galatasaray get their first win in 20 years in Kadikoy? Let's talk about that first. Pat, what do you think? First win for Galatasaray in 20 years or not? Uh, I don't want to say anything that will, uh, how do I say, bring the Nazar evil light at all. Um, so I'm going to be very careful with my words. 
I think um, for Fenerbahce, you know, bad season, not, not going to lie. Um, however, you know, we, we can see that if they do want to do something, they will. You know, 3-0 down to Besiktas away from home not too long ago, brought that back to 3-0 and could have could have won it, to be honest. Um, I think mm-hmm. you know, with these games, to some extent... Don't form, forget away at Galatasaray coming down from 2-0. Well, exactly, two. yeah. You know, it's the same thing. Um, so I think it it really, you know, to some extent, form goes out the window in terms of where you are in the league. Um, you know, Fenerbahce don't have too much to play for in terms of they're not in the cup. They're not going to get, like you say, fourth place. I think it's more in a weird way, hoping that Galatasaray win the cup so that fifth place will then get a potential European place, if I'm mm-hmm, correct yeah. in that one. You're correct. Uh, which is will be a very strange situation, but there you go. Um, and I think, you know, it, w- what it's going to be is just, um, t- on one hand, the, the unseen side, the, the match preparation that the, the club will do, um, you know, getting them psyched up. You know, I remember um, when we had the likes of Nani and the team and Bruno Alves, uh, that, that um, motley crew, um, when they, I think they did things like getting videos of their family to say, you know, good luck for the game, just as a kind of moral booster. And that did make uh, a difference in the result as well. You know, I think a lot of it is when you do have people that might be playing their first or to some extent second um, intercontinental derbies, that you, you need to get them in the right mood. It's not just like another big game. It's it's the derby. And when you do have a, a sort of potential 20 years record that, Galatasaray have been aching to break for uh, about twenty years, basically. <laughs> you know, it's it's you're you're playing. This is this is your championship. This is your league title, and it's, it's the Undertaker's streak as WrestleMania. Yeah, so it's um a lot of obviously a lot of pressure, but um you know an opportunity to um to see what we can do to to hopefully if all the the pieces fall into place, you know, get a good result and yeah. um, at least salvage something from this. A uh, terrible season. What do you think, Umut? What are you expecting? Well, uh, I hope Galatasaray gets a win, but I'm not <laughs> positive about it uh, because two main center backs are suspended for the game. Uh, yeah. uh, I've heard that uh, Terim is trying to adapt Fernando to play there, but I'm really, I really think Galatasaray would struggle if he plays there because it's an unfamiliar position for him, even uh, in his standard. Uh, but also, I don't trust on our Turkish choices there, uh, Semih Kaya and Ahmet Çalık. Uh, even though Semih pl- did play there uh, in his previous times at Galatasaray. Uh, but I believe there's a really a curse uh, for Galatasaray uh, about these games in Kadıköy. Uh, just reminding the uh, previous game we had in Kadıköy, uh, Tolga GRG missed an open chance. Uh, and Maikon hit the post from his free kick. The, the ball just doesn't go inside the net <laughs> for the Galatasaray there. Uh, I really hope uh, we get a win at the end mm-hmm. uh, of the 20 years uh, we struggled. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine you're hoping for that. Um, Pat, quickly, just prediction scoreline. Oof. Uh... This is it in Turkish, Nazar Demisin, but I'm going to go for 2-1 finish. Um, what's your prediction? I think it will be a 1-1 draw. Okay, I'm going for 2-2. Now let's move over to that other derby. Uh, far smaller derby, of course. Let's not give them too much uh, to uh, talk about in uh, Başakşehir. But Besiktas Başakşehir, uh, Abdullah has had Şenol Güneş's number. It's been since the Mario Gomez uh, season that Besiktas have last beaten by Shakshir. Um, after uh, ever since, only losses and draws. Um, but this is important for both teams. By Shakshir, of course, will want to get a win uh, to put. It, well, I think if Besiktas win this, they've probably won the title, even though they still have a match against uh, against Galatasaray to come. But Regardless of what happens in the the, the Fenerbahce Galatasaray derby, if Bishakshir win this, that will be a massive 
blow to uh, Galt's rise uh, morale and um, obviously could have an impact on that match as well. I mean, let's say Besiktas win, that would of course give Galt's rise extra motivation um, on, on, on different levels going into that Fenerbahce match, but... Uh, I think it's going to be very difficult. I think Abdullah Avcu has his, his plan worked out. Uh, I'm curious to see uh, whether uh, Besiktas are going to go into that match with a similar lineup as they did against Chaiko Rizespor. They played a lot of passes over the floor. There wasn't a lot of long balls played or anything like that. And I really like that type of football. Um, they were experimenting, I think, against Rizespor with uh, quick combination football to get underneath uh, away from underneath the pressure that's something they're going to need against Bashakchi here so I'm curious if he's finally adjusting to Abdullah Avci there tactically um, but I think at the end of the day it's going to be very difficult uh, and I I'm not really uh, thinking that we will see a winner here I think this is going to end in a draw uh, Umut let's try to you first what's your expectations of the Besiktas Bashakchi here match uh, I think uh if Light shows the same quality he did against Rizespor, Besiktas has a chance against Başakşehir. Uh, but one of the best things Başakşehir does is the defending process. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, from the start of the game to the until the end, they show a, like a huge power. Uh, they have a lot of uh, discipline. Yeah, yeah, endurance uh, also. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh, the fact that Başakşehir has a high age level players uh, is a like disadvantages against Besiktas, who has a, a younger players on the field. Also, uh, like they're uh, searching for more uh, in the game. Uh, but uh, Başakşehir uh, uh, has a, be a better run uh, in the recent uh, weeks. Uh, I think uh, Besiktas has a chance of winning. Yeah, I mean, it's, they always have a chance, they're at home, um, so it's definitely not outside of the realm of possibility. Uh, Pat, what's your opinion? What do you think? Yeah, I think, um, obviously, Bashak have got like a, a solid team there. Um, they've got a strong defense as well, which um, obviously will need to be aware that you know Besiktas do have the, the possibility of scoring up to seven. However, I think... Especially with the the derby game coming up, um, you know, Bashakshi will be going for it, wanting, knowing that, um, let's say, if, if the home team do win on Sunday, that they'll then have a nine point gap over uh, Galatasaray, which, um, you know, even with the yeah. away game to them, penultimate a, week as well. A win for Bashakshi here almost guarantees them the title, I think. Uh, sorry yeah. for interrupting, but uh, is there any players suspended for the match from both sides? Uh, let me think. I don't think I, any of the Besiktas players got a suspension, and uh, no, no Besiktas players are suspended. But Ricardo Quaresma is out injured uh, with an ankle ligament issue. Uh, he'll be out for uh, another three weeks or so. So Quaresma definitely won't play. So but has to be pointed out uh, in the last three away games that Quaresma didn't play. Besiktas won 6-0 away at Torshaven, 6-2 away at Antalya Spor, and 7-2 away at Rize Spor. Interesting. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, but let's let's move over to predictions, scoreline predictions. Uh, Pat, what do you think uh, of the besiktas Bashakshir game? Um, I'm going to go for what you go, went for for the Super Derby and go for 2-2. What do you think, Umut? I think uh, Besiktas will win 2-1. Okay, I'm going for 1-1. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the exact same, exact same, same yeah. lines, Just uh, except, uh, yeah. But let's cool. uh, quickly take a look then at uh, the remaining fixtures of match day 28 coming up next week, of course. On Friday, we have Bursa Spore hosting Trabzonspor. A very interesting game as well there for both at both sides of the uh, of the table, really. Bursa Spore, of course, need to start winning some games. And Trabzonspor, if they win, they put pressure on Besiktas for third place. Then on Saturday, we have Chaiko Sport taking on Gustepe, Atiker Konya Sport taking on uh, Sivas Sport, and then, of course, the late game on Saturday will be Besiktas hosting Bashakshi here at Vodafone Park. Then on Sunday, we have Kon uh, Kayseri Sport taking on Ankara Guju, Antalya Sport taking on Kasim Pasha, Malatya Sport taking on Alanya Sport, 
And then finally, the main event, Fenerbahce against Galatasaray, will be the evening game. And then on Monday, we have one more match remaining. Bukshare Ability Erzum Sport taking on Akisar. And the winner, if there is a winner of that match, will still have a chance at staying in the league. But it's a must-win match for both. A draw doesn't help either side. So that's it for match day 28. We'll be back with uh, with uh, that next week. Burak Sezgin will be back joining me. Uzar Dinjar will also be back. Uh, unless something happens, of course. But I'm sure that both uh, Pat and Umut would uh, step in if that's not the case. And I hope you all enjoyed listening to both Pat and Umut. And please give them a follow on Twitter. You can find them at PTCX, if I'm not mistaken, for Pat. Correct, yeah. And you can find Umut at... At Eidolast, E Y D O L A S T. You can find both of them on Twitter. Please let them know what you thought of their appearance on the podcast today, and they'll definitely be recurring guests. And guys, thank you both so much for coming on to the show and uh, bailing us out because those two uh, co hosts of mine uh, had better things to do tonight. Thank you very much for having us. It's yeah, been a pleasure. Thank you very again. much. Yeah, and thank you very much for listening to episode 8 of Football a la Turca hope to get you all back next week and uh, let's uh, look forward to those derbies and hopefully a great week of football and some spectacular goals as we saw to in this match day good night good night or good morning or good afternoon or whenever you're listening to